So now in Jeremiah chapter 2, we read the first verse. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. So we see that here, God, brethren, God is reminiscing a little bit. He's looking back and he's saying, well, if you just stayed like you were before, you know, look at some of the better days. He's looking at some of the better days in the past. If you just stayed like you were before, you know, kindness of your youth, love of your betrothal, you were kind of in love with God at, at first and so on and so forth. So God is looking back. He's looking back at a time before Israel, the house of Israel and the house of Judah went astray. So here he is making them remember the way it used to be. And then he continues his chapter in, in verse 3. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. So we see that in verse 4, this is a message to a, all of Israel and also you know, that would include Judah, because Judah is part of Israel. However, we need to keep in mind still that in Jeremiah's day, this message reached only Jews. But yet, even though it reached only Jews, it is indeed for all Israel. And now we're going to find the terms that God uses to refer to his people in the last days. And those terms really prove that they cannot be just one country, brethren. They cannot be, be, therefore, they cannot be only, for example, the state of Israel or the United States of America. So it cannot be one country because those terms also prove that they cannot be just one group of people because they are not, you know, they're not one family. Have you noticed all the families in plural of the house of Israel? So they're not one family. They're not one country. And we see that again and again and again that it is one of the best proofs of our doctrine about the house of Israel, brethren. I refer today in my message to us in Serbian. We were covering Jeremiah chapter 11. We're in Jeremiah chapter 11. And uh, I did underline once again the importance of the doctrine of the house of Israel. Brethren, that's one of the pillar doctrines of the church. That's one of the pillar doctrines of the Philadelphia remnant. Because the Philadelphia remnant is the one which is given the key of David. And what is the key of David? The key of David is really understanding the house of David or the throne of David or the uh, covenant which God made with David that always until the end of our days of this world, there will be always a descendant of David sitting on that throne. But by extension, that also means that we understand the identity of modern Israel. Because how in the world can we understand the throne of David, which rules over a part of the house of Israel, if we do not understand the identity of the modern house of Israel? So it is very important for us always to keep in mind that we as a Philadelphia remnant are to understand, accept and love the doctrine about the house of Israel. Many people over the years have rejected it, brethren. And many of them are my good friends with whom I used to share the feasts, uh, share the Sabbath times, uh, uh, keep the Sabbath with, uh, uh, associate with on various occasions. Many of my dear friends who are very dear to me have sadly lost the uh, importance or even the understanding of the modern day house of Israel. I think that would be very pernicious for us to forget. So therefore, we realize now that, you know, Israel is not only one family because they are all the families of the house of Israel and they're not one country. And we see that again and again and again that that is one of the best proofs of the doctrine with which we believe. Because this term, house of Jacob, hear the word of the Lord, oh, house of Jacob, is mentioned only twice in this book. One other place where it is used is Amos chapter 3 and verse 13 uh, as house of Jacob. So here again, we have a tie between the prophets, in this case, between Jeremiah and Amos. Now, imagine the term house of Jacob used only twice in Jeremiah and once in Amos. And that is 
in these books, nowhere else. Now, however, the following term, which says, at all the families of the house of Israel, the following term, the house of Israel, is used 20 times just in the book of Jeremiah. Now, he talks about all the families, that would be, you know, family of Reuben and Simeon and Gad and Issachar and Zebulun and Ephraim and Manasseh. So, all the families of Israel. He may be speaking more primarily of the ten tribes, indeed, when he says the house of Israel, because we know that the house of Israel is really composed today of the ten tribes that got lost after their captivity by the Assyrian armies. And now the prophecy continues in verse 5. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have you, your fathers, found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Now this word, what injustice have your fathers found in me, the word injustice in this verse is from the Hebrew word evel, and it would be better translated as lawlessness or inconsistent in standard. So God is asking, now what inconsistency in standard have your fathers found in me, or what lawlessness have your father fathers found in me that they have gone from me far, far, far from me? So, what did your fathers find lawlessness in me, ask God, you know? So, the question is not what sin have their fathers found in him, because we know God cannot sin, and they did not find God to be a sinner. But in what way God is not a lawful being, that they are gone far from me? That's what God asked these descendants of the ancient fathers. And they walk out of vanity, you know, God says, that is, they walk in idolatry. They are idolaters. Now, you know, in some places it says that the, the children or the sons became even worse than their fathers. For some time, brethren, I was wondering what it really meant. But really, when you consider about it, when Israel was taken out of Egypt, out of its bondage and captivity, uh, Israel at that time, as it moved through the wilderness, toward the promised land, we find no incident of Israel sacrificing their children to, you know, to pagan gods. We find the instruction given to Israel, when you come into the land that I've given you, you know, for an inheritance, make sure that you do not inquire how those other nations have served their gods and say, let us serve the God, our God the way that these nations have served their gods. We find that very stern uh, instruction and very stern warning in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12. And so therefore, when they were moving through the wilderness, we don't read of any incidents of having human sacrifice, you might say. So those will be the fathers. But then, you know, before entering the promised land, all those fathers who were rebellious in the wilderness, they all died. And their next, so their sons, the next generation crossed Jordan and entered into the promised land. And what they have done, they had done exactly what God told them not to do. They've seen all those other nations, those seven nations that were uh, occupying the land at that time. They saw how those nations served their gods. They saw human sacrifice. And in order to appease uh, those pagan gods, they began sacrificing their own children. So that's what I think is uh, what God means, among other things, when he says that the children were even worse than their fathers. And it always behooves me, brethren, and I may, made that reference already in Serbian this afternoon, always behooves me how incredible you have, a, you had, a, you know, slaves. Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Slaves with no right, no human rights whatsoever, uh, slaves being exploited to the to the utmost, you know, uh, levels of exploitation, and all of a sudden, and they were enslaved in at that time the most powerful country in the world, and then all of a sudden, God Eternal by miracles destroys at that time the mightiest nation on the face of the earth, delivers Israel, which has no rights whatsoever, and makes out of you know, out of uh, uh, slaves, despite slaves, he makes a nation. What is more, his own nation. Absolutely amazing. And yet, Israel still rebels, and Israel still wanted to go back into Egypt. 
When they didn't go back into Egypt, the next generation, which entered into the promised land, just became even worse than their fathers, worse in being totally grateful to the great God. And sometimes we wonder, how can that be? Well, brethren, frankly, that's human nature. Human nature, which is very forgetful, which is rebellious against God. You know, that's why we have that human nature. You know, when we say human nature, we have the nature which Satan has been instilling in us ever since our birth. We are not born with a human nature, of course. We're born like, you know, innocent babies indeed. But then Satan, through his broadcasting various attitudes and bad things and bad ideas and bad theories and all that kind of rubbish that he broadcasts, he just creates in us the human nature, which is totally rebellious against God, as we see in the history of Israel. And that's why we need to realize that, yes, it's kind of, it's kind of silly, it's kind of ridiculous to think, you know, how could people, how could people who were just slaves, abject slaves, who became a nation led by the eternal through the wilderness? Because he was the pillar of, pillar of cloud, he was like an air condition, uh, you know, in, in, during the day. Because you know how the days are terrible in the, in, in, uh, terribly hot in, in a desert, desert. And then at night he was a pillar of fire. He was their heating system, rather, <laughs> heating system for free. And you wonder how could, how could a nation like that, how could a group of people be so ungrateful? Well, brethren, that's the human nature. And we all need to realize we have that same human nature in us. And that's why in this, uh, starting from the next Sabbath, uh, in this pre-Passover period, we need to really Examine ourselves in the light of God's word and think, where else is this human rebellious nature working in me against the law of God? And also by extension, if you wish, against the government of God as well. Because God installed his government in his church for the purpose of making us uh, uh, to grow into perfection. Not to make us grow into imperfection or uh, heresies or whatever kind of errors that might be out there. In any case... Therefore, we, back to Israel, of which the house of Judah is part, and here is Jeremiah prophesying to the house of Judah of his time, that's the Old Testament house of Judah. We have this word injustice, so God says, what injustice, what lawlessness has your fathers found in me, that they would just, you know, go far away from me and abandon me and serve other gods? In the book of Isaiah, we'll be reading one of these days, God says, you know, have you ever seen a nation which changed, replaced me, the only living God, with Foreign gods. Have you ever seen a nation like that? No, we haven't seen a nation like that. <laughs> you know, the, the, the history of Israel is quite, it's quite unique, brethren. Quite unique. But that's the history of, because it's in a sense a history of us. Because today we are spirit-led Israel. And when you analyze, if we just, if we are honest with ourselves, when we analyze ourselves, our attitudes, our various things that we do go through, various trials and things, various giants that we have to join, that we have to uh, meet and, 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 and encounter in our lives, we, we could say, honestly, that yes, we are in a sense, we are kind of rel reliving again. We are kind of repeating the history of Israel. But the only difference is, and the key difference is, that we have the Spirit of God to overcome all of that and not to allow our human nature to prevail against the Spirit of God. Israelites did not have the Spirit of God. They were just a physical nation indeed. So then anyway, the question is, you know, why... Uh, you know, the question is what your fathers have found. What is so different? What is so difficult about me that your fathers, you know, would just go, go away from me and serve mute idols? Verse six, neither did they say, where is the Lord? So they were not seeking the Lord, you see. Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of David? Better you see that point. He's always bringing us back to that point where they were abject slaves. All of a sudden they're freed from Egypt, you know. Just like us, we were just abject slaves to sin before we were freed from the land of Egypt, from our spiritual Egypt, you know. But we still have to battle sometimes our forgetfulness. We have to battle our human nature and our rebellious hearts against the law of God because to us it doesn't make sense. Why shouldn't we have, why shouldn't we own guns, you know, in this dangerous world? To us and to our carnal minds, it doesn't make sense. This part of God's law, that part of God's law, well, brother, we have to live by faith, not by sight, you see. That's another great challenge for the God's church. And if you wish for Philadelphia remnant in particular, to live by faith. No, it's not easy. It's the hardest thing in the world, if you ask me. But it's, it's interesting, you know, the, uh, when did, when did he br bring them out of the land of Egypt? He brought them out on the, on the first day of unleavened bread. <laughs> that was the point. And, you know, he keeps bringing even these descendants of ancient Israel, 
you know, those who were brought out of Egypt, he keeps bringing them back to that point, you know. He keeps reminding them who they were. Just like you might remember in the book of Revelation to the church of Ephesus, he says, remember where you have come from. So he keeps reminding Israel, including us, spirit-led Israel, where we came from. We were just abject sinners, slaves to sin. He delivered us. And now he's leading us through the wilderness of this world toward our promised land, which is the kingdom of God. And we encounter all kinds of challenges like Israelites did. So anyway, the fathers, neither did they, did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, <coughs> through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. Can you imagine the area where they went, brethren? So here in one, uh, in one word, he uses two different words for men, by the way. The first word he uses is the Hebrew word ish. So no individual, no person ever. When he says no individual, no person ever crossed that land. No ish, brethren, no man ever crossed that land through which the Israelites were led by the God Almighty. Just like when you analyze, uh, I was thinking today about my own biography. Uh, and If you think about your own biography, brethren, you may conclude that not many people will have the same kind of experiences and the same things that you went through. Oh, I'm sure they, you would conclude that. I, I've concluded that myself, indeed. And uh, I guess that's part of being a Philadelphia remnant in a sense, you know, plenty of experience which leads us to growing love for God's truth and growing love for God's word and growing love for the people God has called, however imperfect they are. And here we have that no individual even crossed that land, but God led them through the land. So the word ish it's not distinguishing male and female, but it is just that no individual ever crossed that land. And then we have another word, no Adam, or no man, because Adam means man in Hebrew, ever dwelt in that wilderness. Now you may wonder, why does God use two different words? Well, apparently, in some cases, it is emphasizing masculine. In some places, it emphasizes men as earthbound temporary mortal being and in other in the other term he's talking about us as individuals or beings and then he goes on to say in verse 7 i brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness but when you entered you defiled my land and may made my heritage an abomination just like i mentioned to you uh a few minutes ago. How could they not make the land abomination when they sacrificed their own children to those horrible, disgusting pagan deities? So he brought them into a bountiful country, brethren. The Hebrew word is actually Carmel. The land of Carmel. Because the word Carmel actually means plentiful or bountiful. Uh, you can find the same expression in the book of Isaiah in chapter 33 and in chapter 35. So in Isaiah 33 verse 9 and in Isaiah 35 verse 2, you'll find exactly the same term, Carmel, plentiful, bountiful. So God brought them into a plentiful country. Now, of course, today what we see in that country, there is no plentiful anymore. There was the land flowing with milk and honey. But they made it abomination, brethren. It became a desert lifeless desert because their abominations destroy that country you see now in the state of israel we see because a uh, good part good portion of the jewish people now live in the state of israel they've made out of that desert i could say a very uh, lovely lovely country really which merits my admiration basically there is no free spot in that country in, in that land in which the jewish people there have not used to plant life you know it's uh, either a flower or a tree or whatever that, that i've never seen so many flowers in a town like i've seen in jerusalem and in my town here where i live in ujice those are the two towns where i've seen the the, the, the largest amount of <laughs> flowers you know dotting the, the the windows and 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 the buildings i've seen it only in my town here and in jerusalem but you see the land that land didn't used to be a desert 
that land was flowing with milk and honey. But you know, their heritage, the God's heritage, when they entered, they defiled their land with human sacrifices and all other kinds of abominations, and they made the whole land an abomination, you see. But God originally, of course, as we know, God didn't, you know, God wouldn't take them into a deserted and horrible kind of land. Whatever God does, He does it perfectly with beauty and, and, and love. Just like we know from his plan that, you know, when he, when he, we know that gap theory, when he created the land, the earth, the earth certainly was not tohu and bohu, void and formless. It was certainly very beautiful. But then due to the uh, rebellion of the angels, it became, like it says in Hebrew, it doesn't say the word was. No, the original Hebrew has the land, the, the earth became Tohu and Bohu. So the same here with the promised land. The promised land was beautiful, bountiful, and then it became abomination. And here is a quiet, here is quite a condemnation. When they entered, they defiled his land, brethren. Now, does that mean that they morally defiled the land? Does that mean agriculturally? Does that mean by, you know, by spraying it with pesticides, by irrigation? Yes, brethren. Yes, indeed. People used chemicals to spray back in those days as well. <laughs> there is nothing new under the heaven, remember? King Solomon tells us nothing new is under the heaven. What, that which it was will be again. So yes, they used chemi chemicals even back in those days. You know, God gave them healthy and, 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 and beautiful uh, uh, arable land and they defiled the land and made God's heritage an abomination. Morally, by irrigation, by using sprays, pesticides, they destroyed what was God's heritage. And the land became, you know, an abomination. When, before they entered, it was flowing with milk and honey. Verse 8. The priests, oh, here is now condemnation of the priests, of the upper echelon of the society. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal. And walked out of things that do not profit. So brethren, you see the people that handle the law should be the ones that know God the most. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But you know, those who should have handled the law were, as we read in this verse, ignorant. The priests were indifferent. You know, they say, well, where is God anyway? We don't know where God is. Oh, you, you know, Christ coming, well, you know, make a parallel with today's, with today's situation. Christ coming back? Oh, come on, come on. Christ might not come back. We see the rulers. You see, he's, he's, you see the priests, the rulers, the prophets, and then come the common people. The rulers also transgressed against me. In some translations it says, pastors also transgressed, transgressed against me. But, you know, the proper term is really rulers, not the pastors, but the rulers, the civil rulers rather than pastors. And all that we need to see today is the civil rulers in the modern Israel. You don't know, you, you, you cannot really determine, it's hard to determine which one of those rulers is really the most abominable, the most detestable, the most rebellious against God Most High. And I'm alluding primarily to Canada, whose prime minister, according to the news this week, disappeared and was hiding in an unknown place. I'm alluding to New Zealand. I'm alluding to Australia. And I'm alluding, of course, to the American president, who has pushed the American society, I think, into an, into an abyss, whose end we who read the Bible know. We know the end, but the society of America probably in general does not know really. What is the end of that abyss? So, uh, you know, this is speaking really about the rulers back in those days in that society of the Jews. You know, the rulers who really were ignorant and, uh, you know, there who were, you know, people who didn't care about the law. They were just caring about their own pockets and their money and, uh, you know, how to accumulate wealth and so on. So it's not really about pastors. But nevertheless, brethren, speaking of pastors... The Protestants always want to make you think that everything that is in the New Testament can, uh, New Testament canon was new. You know, everything there is new. Well, if they want, they want to get away from anything that goes back to the Old Testament. And there are plenty of things in the New Testament that go back to the Old Testament. Take, for example, the book of Romans. 
If you were to delete all the quotes, all the Old Testament quotes in the book of Romans, you would end up with uh, scarcely several verses that put together make no sense whatsoever, brethren. But you know, those Protestants want to, you know, tell you and, and convince you that it, you know, whatever, whatever, everything that is in the New Testament canon was really new, nothing was old, really. Well, speaking of Romans again, take for example what we are been, what we have been emphasizing lately, Romans 11, about Israel being the, uh, you know, the, the olive, olive plant to which the Gentiles are going to be added, you see. Well, what is that? It's a direct reference to the Old Testament. How would we know what the plan of God is unless we knew the history of the Old Testament Israel? How would we understand even the New Testament dispensation if we do not understand the modern identity of the modern descendants of the house of Israel? How simple, how plain, brethren. And there is one saying that I heard once when I was at Ambassador College that the uh, new is in the old contained and the old is in the new explained. And that makes perfect sense. Yes, you have the elements of the New Testament right there in the old. Then we have quotes of the old from the Old Testament in the new and then there is an explanation of those things, particularly in the book of Hebrews. So, you know, all those Protestants, they all want to make you think you have got all this new structure in the New Testament. Not so, brethren. Because notice the word pastors, even though the word is rather rulers, notice the word pastors. So, brethren, that means that they had pastors in the Old Testament. Oh, yes, indeed. They had elders of the synagogue. They had and still have deacons of the synagogues. Now, the Greek word, the Greek word apostello, in a Greek version of the Old Testament, is all the way through the Old Testament, and it means one sent by God for a specific purpose. So you see, all the names of leaders that Protestants will have you believe were all new in the New Testament, not one of them is new, brethren, except for the word evangelist. And that just shows that God did not mean for anybody to go around trying to get everyone to be warned about their sins or be converted back in the Old Testament. Now here we read about pastors who are also, you know, transgressing. They are also transgressed against God. And this word transgress is actually more flagrant because it is the Hebrew word pasha, which means revolted, rebelled. You know, those rulers, civil, revolted or rebelled against God. Yeah, just look at the laws that they've been enacting in your Anglo-Saxon world. It's all rebellious. It's all revolted against God eternal. They got bitter in their nature. That's what it means in Hebrew, brethren. They disliked the government and the law and authority, the authority of God, obviously. So they revolted, they rebelled. It is not transgressed. That is a misfortunate translation there. The pastors haven't just gone out to transgress. They rebelled against authority and law and government and against God's way. And of course we see that right now in our own day and age. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked out of things that do not profit, says Jeremiah. Brethren, in a lot of cases word Baal is just a general name that means all of the Lord's. As the word Baal literally means, it means all of the Lord. So there was a myriad of, you know, little Baals, Baalim, and they were all just part of that sun worship that Israel constantly continued, that Israel brought out with them out of Egypt and continued to worship sun to this day. Because all of these so-called Christian customs are nothing more but sun worship, brethren. And speaking of Baal, have you ever wondered, I found that in one of the, uh, one book in Croatian language, explanation. Have you ever wondered the word, the origin of the word cannibalism? Cannibalism. It comes from Hebrew. Kohen or Khan, which would mean uh, a priest, and Baal. And it really means the priests of Baal. But we know what the cannibals are. Well, here is the truth, brethren. 
the true priests of God were eating the flesh of sacrificed animals. The priests of Baal were sacrificing children. And they were eating of those sacrifices. That's why we have the cannibalism as a universal term in our languages, brethren. You may have not known that until now, but now is the time to know the truth. And I'm glad to do that creation book that revealed to me that truth. I never really realized how how and why we got cannibalism. It's a universal word I've encountered in Spanish, in English. Uh, I'm sure that you've encountered it in all the other languages that you speak. We have it in Serbian language, in Croatian. In all the Slavic languages we have cannibalism. And I never realized what it really means. Priests of Baal, brethren, who are eating the flesh of sacrificed children. That's what it means. So in a lot of cases, Baal is just a general name that means all of the lords. That's what Baal means. So when it says that the prophets prophesied by Baal, it can mean the Baal, the son of God, or it may mean uh, that the deity that we find in the Old Testament law, Murdoch or Moloch, or it can mean any other, any number of gods. But in a lot of cases, they pluralize it. They put it Baalim, which I mentioned just a minute ago, showing it is lords, plural. So this is all the different gods which all those, of course, nations in the promised land served, and then Israel just, you know, in its rebellion, rebellion against God, just inherited and incorporated in their own religion. Now, the prophets prophesied by Baal, and that is true in the modern house of Israel today, brethren. That is not true in some of the other religions or some of the other countries. You see, prophets in the Israelites' land, they prophesied by their background, Sunday keeping and Easter keeping and all the days of Baalim. In other countries, there you know there are not such days. For example, in Islam religion, you know they have no the days of Baalim. In Hinduism, Buddhism, those religions don't have the way of Baalim. In the house of Israel, they prophesied by Baal. It happened in the Old Testament. It's happening now in our time. They have taken all those pagan ways and put the Christian label on it. And that's today why we have the modern Christianity serving. Baal. All of the Christian, so-called Christian customs, rather, revolve around sun worship. So whoever Israel is, and of all the people on the face of the earth, we as a Philadelphia remnant should know whoever Israel is. Their prophets prophesy by Baal, and they walk out of things that do not profit. Now, the fact that, as I said, in other religions you don't find Baalim days, but we find it in modern Christianity, therefore, we would know that the modern time, modern day of Israel, would be all Christian nations, right? Right. Verse 9. Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children I'll bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and see. Send to Kedar and consider diligently. And see if there has been such a thing. So here is he is saying that you can go from Cyprus all the way to Arabia and see if the other countries have ever changed their gods. No country has ever done it, brethren. No nation has ever done it. Except for one. God's own people, Israel. You know, when we were reading the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah starts with, you know, the, the, the donkey knows his owner, and the cattle know who, where is their place of rest, where there's tables, but my people have no clue who am I. And then Isaiah asks, have you ever seen a nation that changed its own gods for foreign gods? No, we haven't seen such a nation. But my people, God says, my people have changed me. The living God, for the gods, foreign gods, gods of those other nations that were around them in the promised land, brethren. How amazing. And that cult continues all the way to our times. Now it's called Christianity. It's labeled, you know, Christmas, Easter, Halloween, and all that other Christian names that they really have nothing of Christian in their, in their own nature. Their own nature is satanic. Just like the booklet we have, you know, choose between the holidays or satanic holidays. The fact that something has a label Christian means absolutely nothing. You know, you can label me an African, I'm still a European, and I, you know, I cannot deceive you. You can label a cat, you know, you can label my cats and say tigers, they're still cats nevertheless. So we can label whatever custom we have, 
you know, as Christian, that doesn't mean anything because the nature of those customs is, is, is pagan to the core. It's, it's, it's serving Satan. But people say, but, well, but no, we're not serving Satan. We, we, we honor Christ with that. Well, and then I'll tell them, well, how can you honor Christ on Christmas when Christ was not born in Christ? Well, it doesn't matter, they say. He was certainly born, so we'll just honor the fact that he was born. Well, I'm like, well, isn't that a flawed reasoning? Because the day that you're celebrating, the day that you picked, is the day of the birth of the Son. That's established in history. So therefore, if you label it Christ's birth, does it make it Christ's birth? No, it doesn't make it Christ's birth. And after all, I say, if you want to honor when he was born, well, why don't you just at least follow what is in God's word? Because we can calculate the approximate date of his birth by what we need, know in the Bible. We know when John the Baptist was born, and there are six months apart between him and Jesus Christ. So there we go, we come straight to the fall holidays. And he was most likely born perhaps on the Day of Trumpets or sometimes around the Feast of Tabernacles. Anyway, he was born in the fall, not in winter. So I say, if you want to honor the fact that he was born, why in the world don't you keep the fall holidays? No, but you chose winter when the sun is dead and the pagans need to, uh, to uh, what, what's the word, um, prop him up, you know, to, 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 to be alive and pray to it, you know, to, 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 to become alive again and so on. You see how flawed human reasoning is, brethren. It's unbelievable. But they label it a Christian holiday. Christ's birth. No, you cannot call it Christ's birth because it's the birth of the Son. And again, I tell those who don't really keep the God's commandments, well, if you really want to honor the fact that he was born, start keeping holidays. He was born in the fall holiday season. Oh no, they won't do it because, you know, the evil, rebellious human heart brethren wants to follow its own devices and its own customs, instigated by Satan, of course. Instigate is the word I was looking for. So the pagans would instigate, you know, the sun, to sun to finally rise again. So they would just, why do we have all these fireworks and, and, and fires being lit in, in those dark days? Well, the pagans are instigating, you know, their sun gods to, 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 to rise to its full splendor again and so on, brethren. Anyway, we read in, 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 in verse 10, you know, uh, God says to the prophet, you can go all the way and see if, if any country has ever changed their, their, their gods. Now, yes, indeed, some countries have changed their gods. Yes, we, we cannot say that that's not true, because some countries have changed from Hinduism to Islam. Some have changed from Islam to Hinduism. So, you know, some have, but a lot of them have never really changed their gods. So here he's giving us two opposite directions. Pass over the coastlands of Mediterranean and all the way down to Arabia. And Kedar is one of the areas in Arabia. And see if any nation has done that. What my people have done. Verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods? Which are not gods. But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. And here is also a poor translation, brethren. The Jews thought this was so sacred to talk about God's glory that they dared not translate it the way it says in the Hebrew. So the priests changed this and they put it their glory. That is not what it says in the Hebrew, brethren. The Hebrew is his glory. My people have changed his glory for what does not profit. And this is how God views the nations. Once they accepted pagan gods, they always perpetuated the pagan religions. But Israel rejected the true God then bounced around between other gods, trying to find one. Gentile nations, brethren, keep their gods. Israel had been given the truth and rejected it, so they could not find anything else permanent to worship. Then, God continues through Prophet Jeremiah in verse 12. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. Now the term suggests that the country is so struck that they don't even have clouds. You know, they don't even have vapors. It's just very desolate. <laughs> you know, how, how struck by, awe, by, by horror is this? Completely desolate, you know, not even vapors. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and 
hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So God's people have committed two evils. The Hebrew word is rach. Rach, which means evil. So it is a good translation here in English. It is evil, naturally or morally. And those prophets had forsaken God and then the one they chose did not work. (laughs) Now in many other places in the Bible, God is called the fountain of living waters. And what Israel has done, including the house of Judah, because this is the prophecy of the house of Judah, they hewn cisterns that can hold no water. So brethren, all of their religious practices that they have taken to themselves instead of God's way, they don't produce what they should produce. If you go the way of God's fountain of living waters, then you get living waters. It pays. It's worth it. You will be blessed. And it is a abundant life. In fact, a lot of these Old Testament scriptures caused the Jews at the Feast of Tabernacles to have a pouring water ceremony. So every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, they had pouring out of water and they reminded you of all those scriptures in the Old Testament that talked about the living water and the promise of God's Spirit later on to be poured down on all men like living waters. By the way, for the, at, the last day of, uh, at the last day of the feast, that is the last great day, the Jews had a ceremony of pouring water on the stairs of the temple. They would come up with jugs full of water, they would just be pouring water. That was, brethren, indeed the symbol, the symbolism of God's Spirit being poured upon all mankind following the second resurrection. Now, of course, Jews are not aware of that, but we who understand the Bible, we know why they have that custom, you see. <laughs> Verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he plundered? Well, if they were treated like slaves by other captors, and yet that was not what God meant for them to be. Verse 15, the young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. So you see, some of the powers that are going to end up punishing Israel, brethren, are newer categories, newer countries. They are young lions. They are not the old lion like Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. They are not old lions like some of the world's governments that have been in existence for a long time, like Egypt and Assyria. But some of them, you know, are young lions. And this description is not really of the old days, obviously. But in our time, this is descriptiveness of the atomic and hydrogen bombs The cities in the modern house of Israel burned and without inhabitant. In our day and in our age, with all this modern weaponry, cities can literally be burned and without inhabitant, brethren, and the land may literally be waste. So this means that this is a prophecy for our time. Yes, it's in the Old Testament, but it could not be ever fulfilled in the Old Testament. Only in our day and age, with all this modern weaponry, it can be fulfilled. So much for those who say that the Old Testament scriptures is completely relevant for our modern lives. Verse 16. Also the people of Nof and Tafnis have broken the crown of your head. So here are the areas down in Egypt. They tried to lean on and trust in Egypt to be delivered from the powers of Babylon and Assyria. But they are not someone you can lean on. Now the the, the Bible word Nof refers to the modern city of Memphis which was the capital of Lower Egypt, just south of Cairo, the capital of Egypt. And this place is mentioned quite a bit in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, in Jeremiah, and also in Ezekiel. So north would be Memphis. And Tafnis is another branch of the Nile River, and it is a city located down there. Now notice a little later in Jeremiah chapter 43, it refers again to this. It's in Jeremiah 43 verse 7. So we might get a context here. In Jeremiah 43, we have an account of the king's daughters being taken down into the land of Egypt, along with Jeremiah and Baruch in verse 7. And where did they go in Egypt? Well, they went to Tafnis. And in fact, in 1886, an archaeologist named Flinders Petrie, who was digging around the area of Tafnis, discovered a ruin 
with Hebrew name on it. The words say, the palace of the daughter of Judah. So, Brandon, undoubtedly, that is the place where the daughters of Zedekiah, the last Jewish king, stayed. And there are plenty of historical corroboration to this claim. And possibly one of these days we'll have a message that would uh, deal with this and remind us of uh, the part of the mission that Jeremiah had. Well, the part of the mission was that he would transplant the throne of David from the king of Judah into the scattered Israel. And that's exactly what he did through one, the, through one of the Zedekiah's daughters. In fact, through his younger younger daughter, Tamara, Tamara Tefi, Tamar Tefi, Palm Beautiful in translation from Hebrew. Because that younger daughter came with Jeremiah to Ireland, Northern Ireland in fact, and then she married into the uh, Irish royal house. And from their marriage, that marriage proceeded a long line of Irish kings, later Scottish kings, and then the English kings uh, on the throne, of which is today occupied by Queen Elizabeth II. By the way, speaking of her, tomorrow, February 6th, will be exactly the 70th anniversary of her coronation, brethren. And it's, it's an amazing biography of that lady, because when you, consider, when you consider the following facts, she was never supposed to be a ruler, because it was her uncle, the older brother of her, of her father, uh, so her uncle was supposed to be on that throne, but uh, her uncle basically abdicated because he wanted to get married to a divorced woman from America, so that disqualified him from becoming an heir on the throne of David. So instead of him, Queen Elizabeth's father came to the throne. Uh, he was uh, he was having problems with muttering. There is a lovely movie out there, King's Speech. Uh, it's about her father, by the way. And then he died very young. So she was 25 when she basically was coronated. What an amazing biography of that woman. And tomorrow... February the 6th is the 70th anniversary of that coronation. She has been the longest ruling British king. So she is the longest ruling monarch on the throne of David. We know that because we know the history and the identity of the modern house of Israel, brethren. And we are going to see how all these other things are going to fare because, you know, uh, she is very popular among the people, but not the family members. Particularly her son is not very popular and uh, let alone some other of her sons, her other son, Andrew, who has been charged now with sexually abusing a lady because he was a close friend to Jeffrey Epstein and so on and so forth. So, you know, but nevertheless, I was reminded today that, you know, this might be a very difficult year for the, for the Queen, but it is her 70th anniversary of her coronation. And she is a direct descendant of the daughter that was brought to Ireland by... Our prophet, the prophet we have been reading about, the prophet Jeremiah. And how wonderful and lovely we see the Bible is alive throughout the human history, Brendan, when we understand the true history of humankind. So, again, in 1886, again, it was discovered the uh, palace of the daughter of, Ju of Judah. So, undoubtedly, that is the place where, you know, the daughter of Zedekiah, there were two daughters, Scotta and Tamar Tefi, when they stayed with King, with uh, Prophet Jeremiah. And you see, the more we dig, the more we back up the truth that was revealed by God to Herbert Armstrong. And I'll be eternally thankful to him for, and to God who revealed that truth to him, and to him for his courage to bring out that truth, however strange it was, and however much persecuted he was because of that truth, and however much he was maligned because of that truth, brethren, because today we have more evidence than ever that he was right. And not only do we have evidence, I myself have been more convinced about the truth of Israel than ever before in my life, brethren. Because there is a mountain of evidence which proves to me again one more important fact that the Bible is the living word of God and it is absolute truth, brethren. Absolute truth. So in verse 16, God mentions those two towns by a chance, <laughs> you know, by chance, the capital of Lower Egypt and then another town in another branch of the Nile River, which happened to be where the king's daughter stayed. No, brethren, of course. Now he goes on to say in verse 17, Have you not brought 
this on yourself, in that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way. So God says, don't blame me. You are entitled to what you're getting. You brought it on yourselves. Don't give me a credit for what you're going through because you have earned it. Verse 18, and now, why take the road to Egypt to drink the water of Sihor? Or why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Now, the waters of Sihor, that's meaning the waters of Nile. And the river, uh, when it says the river in the Bible, to drink the waters of the river, that's Euphrates. If he meant Tigris, he would have given us the name Tigris. But when he says the river, that's Euphrates, brethren. So God is asking them, why do you enter into alliance when you just have to trust in God? And we can ask ourselves today, why do we have to enter into alliance with holding guns and doing all kinds of things with the world, alliance with the world, <coughs> when all we have as a Philadelphia remnant is to trust in God and submit to his government? Because they, brethren, entered into the worst idolatry and the worst spiritual adultery. I'm speaking about the uh, the, the society, the, the Jewish society of that time, of Jeremiah's time. Because he's testifying to them. They were always seeking out alliances with everyone, anybody, except with God. And we can do the same, brethren. We can seek alliances with all kinds of ideas and ideologies and we accept to trust in God. Verse 19, your, your own wickedness will correct you. And you, your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and that the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. In other words, your own wickedness, because the real word means evil, uh, from the Hebrew word rach, your own evil will correct you. That means you're going to find out why God said don't do certain things when you pay the penalty for doing it. Your own evil will correct you. You know, it is an interesting, you know, sometimes when people think that God needs God needs their help in order to punish sinners. <laughs> you know, if somebody goes astray and does something wrong, then those of us that are righteous feel like we need to, you know, we need to help God punish the sinners. Well, brethren, in fact, some people... Look at the church as a kind of a place where all the good guys are allowed to stay together and all the bad guys are not allowed there. You know, brethren, yet very often we forget that the church is a spiritual hospital where we are helping everybody overcome their illnesses. And that's important for us to keep in mind as we are approaching the Passover, brethren. We are not so holy to say, oh, don't come near me, I'm holier than you. Brethren, God does not need our help to punish the sinners. When you fall in sin, you get punishment enough. Well, that is what he's saying here in a way. Your own wickedness shall correct you. In this verse, we also see those two evils we have noticed earlier. That you have forsaken the Lord your God. That is the first evil. And if that is not bad enough, if you have not, if you have forsaken the eternal, but you went after things that are not even God's, that is the second evil. And the fear of me is not in you. And this says the Lord God of hosts. So we see different words here, brethren. The word Lord is Adonai. And the word for God is Yahweh, however it is pronounced. The word God here is not Elohim because it is capital G. If it was the word Elohim, it would always uh, be uh, the lower case letters. But if it is the capital letter God, so all the capital letters would be God, it is always Yahweh, the eternal, the one that is and will always be. So here is another different name of God. This is the Lord eternal. And this particular name is in the book of Jeremiah six times. So that is not a complete number by itself. But if we put it together through all the Bible, yes, it will be. Indeed, it will be. Now, how did Jeremiah know to use it only six times <laughs> to make the numbers come out through the whole Bible? Well, because there is, there was, and there is, and there was a God who put the whole Bible together. How logical. How simple to understand. Verse 20. For of old, I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds. And you said, I will not transgress. When on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. So here he's pointing us back to Exodus 19 
when they made that covenant with God to not transgress anymore, and they agreed with God that they would not transgress. But you know, on every high hill and every, under every green tree, they worshipped their Easter service at sunrise. That's why they were on the top, you know, that's why they were on hill, high hill, to be closer to heavens, to worship, to be closer to their gods, to the host of heavens, and to worship their, you know, sun as it rises in the morning, brethren. Every time we read this phrase about high hills and green trees, that is where the pagan goddess Ashtaroth, Astarte Easter, was worshipped because she was sex goddess and goddess of fertility. She was a female god and her cult also dealt with femininity or feminism, if you wish. And her cult was always tied in with temple prostitution in Rome and all of that because she was a version of Venus. Brethren, it is the most despicable kind of worship except for Moloch when your children have to go through fire gods. So God says, you said... You would not transgress and yet, at the same time, some of you are already up there on high hills, under green trees, fornicating and committing idolatry and committing all kinds of lewd acts in the name of Easter, playing the harlot. Verse 21. Yet, I had planted you a noble wine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien wine? In other words, you know when wine is alien, when wine is is better than good for nothing. So they're not good for anything, you see. And yet, they were planted a noble wine. In other words, choice, quality, the best you can get. Like the French wines, they're the best you can get. But it is the same thing recorded in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 2. And even back in Genesis chapter 49 and in verse 11, it used the same terminology that God had planted a choice, top, highest caliber seed available. And how then it had turned into a dejected plant, a strange wine to God? Well, when we don't keep the purest stock, those of you who are in agriculture would know, greetings, special greetings to all of you in a lovely farm up there in a northern country. So, you know, what happens when you don't keep the purest stock? There comes the degeneration of vegetation, as well as degeneration in the animal world. So they turned into alien or foreign wine. Verse 22. For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord. Now lye is a cleansing agent. You can find it in various dictionaries. In the promised land, it was a compound of soap, but a very tough one, a rigorous, very, it was a very vigorous kind of soap. And God has accused them of being the worst of harlots that need to be washed with strongest soap, with uh with lye or hydra, uh, however you pronounce it in, in, in English. But yet they were so polluted that it has not helped. And they were still unclean. And the same word soap, you'll find in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. Malachi 3, verse 2. So that word is used only in Jeremiah here. And then in the book of Malachi, always tying all the prophets together. Malachi 3, 2. You know, that's always an interesting question that is posed in Malachi. In Revelation 6, it says, who can stand when his days, his haste day comes? Well, people, brethren, people that do not have to run, uh, you know, to caves and hide, yeah, they can stand in those days, in that day. In Malachi, this verse shows that either he purifies by scrubbing with soap or by melting when purity is like mining. And yet their iniquity is marked before God. The word iniquity here is rightly translated. It means lawlessness, avon in Hebrew. So we notice in a sense, until someone repents of his or her lawlessness, it is marked before God. So if people refuse to repent of lawlessness, then they are marked before God even in the Old Testament. You see, that Hebrew word is the same exactly as graven, like you put something in a writing in stone. So then he goes on to say in verse 23, How can you say, I have not polluted, I have not gone after the Baals, see your way in the valley, know what you have done. You are a swift dromedary breaking loose in her ways. So God says, how can you say, I have not polluted, when you have... All of the Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, and birthdays, and April Fool's Day, the modern Christians would tell us 
that they are not polluted and that they are not going after Baalim. Yet they don't know what they are doing, brethren. The whole system of their so-called Christianity is Baalim. You know, we can annotate the word son in the margins of our Bible and next to next to verses like this, because verses like this one show that the religion of Israel has always been son worship that has nothing to do with Christ and the apostles. The religion of the house of Israel has always been associated with Baal, sun god and his wife Easter, and all the little gods they had. Now notice, it says, I have not gone after Baal. That's what Israel says. This time it is plural. Baals. So there are a lot of different lords. You know, Moloch is called Baal as well as many, many others. Many of the others. A camel in heat. That's what it says here that Israel is like a swift dromedary breaking loose in her way. Well, those of you who are owners of animals can know what, <laughs> what a pain it is when they're in heat. Just try to imagine a camel in heat. <laughs> In other words, God says they don't know what they are doing, brethren. A camel in heat. Look at what you are doing. Look at your practices. Where did you get all those from? Where did you get all that Sunday and Christmas and Easter and Halloween and immortal soul doctrine and Trinity and ever-burning hell? Where did you get all that? It's like a mixed up camel tracks. You know, camel when it's in heat, it's lost, it's mixed up. Crisscrossing, going nowhere. That's exactly what the religion of the modern house of Israel is. It's going nowhere. No progress, no spiritual peace, no peace of mind. I mean, some of us here in the rest of the world, we just keep wondering what is the next crazier thing that the American society will uh, come up with. All these kinds of uh, new psychological disorders, you know, to, to many of us in the world, are completely, you know, puzzling. What do you mean psychological disorder when... Somebody gets angry because something really should make you angry. Or it's somebody, you know, disorders of all kinds. We have never seen a, a flood of disorders of all kinds of things. But people really, be, you know, behave like total, you know, like camels in heat. You know, totally lost, crisscrossing, mixed up, lost up. They've got nowhere. They've got no goal in their lives. They've got no sense in their lives. They have got no idea what their customs are supposed to be after each Christmas, you know, those people who are lonely, they feel even lonelier. Those people who are there, they're just, just empty. They're just empty-minded, empty-hearted after all those pagan holidays. They just feel empty. They just feel, you know, all that hype was for what? New Year's hype, you know, what, what, what was it for? And so on and so forth, brethren. So Israel today is like that, you know, mixed up like in camel track, tracks. Crisscrossing, going nowhere. Verse 24, a wild donkey used to the wilderness, that sniffs at the wind in her desire. In her time of mating, who can turn her away? All those who seek her will not weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. But brethren, this is the religion of Israel, of the house of Israel, I mean. That is what you are, Israel. Mating all the time with all that paganism and heathenism. Verse 25, withhold your foot from being unshod. And your throat from thirst. But you said, there is no hope. No, for I have loved aliens, and after them I will go. As a thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They and their kings and their princes, and their priests and their prophets. You see, brethren, the house of Israel will be embarrassed when caught. And here he is talking about the ten tribes, about the house of Israel. They've been caught in their idolatry and in their immorality and now they're going down. So now they're ashamed because they're caught like a thief in the act when he's ashamed, when he's caught. He didn't leave anyone out, you see. He primarily indicts the kings, then the next in line, princes, but also the religious leaders, priests and prophets. Verse 27, saying to a tree, you are my father. Well, we have been just, Christmas season has been very recent. In both east and west. In east it was in January. In west it was in December. So people are saying to a tree, oh, they just always choose the, you know, you know, buying a tree, you know, buying a Christmas tree. That's like a big event. So, you know, and then they're going and choosing and saying to a tree, you are my father and to a stone you gave birth to me for they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. You see, brother, they say to a tree or a stone or to a structure they can make out of trees and stones. 
Now stone, by the way, is, is a feminine noun in Hebrew, while tree is a masculine noun. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> you, I don't know if you have masculine and, and, and feminine nouns in, in, in your languages, but yes, we have the same in, in Serbian language, so I, I, I can understand what it really wants to tell us. So a tree is, uh, what it wants to tell us is this. A tree is masculine, referring to my father, and the stone is feminine, to refer to a mother. Now, remember in Matthew 16, Christ said to Peter, as being a Peter, it's not really a name, but a title. So when Christ said, you are Petros, and upon this Petra, I'll build my ecclesia, he might have used those words to Peter to be a title, not a name. And we just mentioned that there are many various lords, titles, you know, in Baal, in, in Baal worship. Now, Peter is one of the twelve foundation stones, and the ecclesia is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, this is like the evol evolutionary theory. What, you know, what do they consider to be our father and what we came from? But when in trouble, they will turn to God. You know, there, there is a saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole. So the only, the only way to make people understand is to put them through the tribulation, through the punishment. And that's exactly what is ahead of the modern house of Israel. They turn their backs to the Bible. They also turn their backs to God of the Bible and not their faces. But it is typically human to seek God when in trouble. And once you're out of trouble, just go, you know, the same old ways again. Verse 28. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise, if they can save you in the time of your trouble, for according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. So God says, where are your Elohims that you made for yourselves? There are all kinds of Baals. Each city of Judah had its own patron god. They got that from Egypt, all that paganism. But today we see the same in nominal Christianity. Every city has its own god, has its own patron saint. At least here in Europe, I'm not sure how it is in other places, but uh, it's the case in the continent where I live. Verse 29, why will you plead with me? You all have transgressed against me, says the Lord. In vain, I have chastened your children. They received no correction. Your swords have devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. See, then God told them what was to happen through the prophets. So he sent the prophets to warn them. The house of Israel killed them. Their own sword killed the prophets. They could be important for our imminent future, brethren. This could be important for our imminent future. Matthew 23. Now Jerusalem is the capital city. Who was there? All the scribes and the Pharisees and elders. Who killed Jesus Christ? Well, it really was not much the Jews as it was the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders. It is really more the religious people and their religion that use the civil authorities to do it with. Remember Jesus Christ, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jesus said those words. So whoever God sent, not only they did not believe him, but they got rid of him in the process. You'll have like Luke 11.47 as a parallel verse to that. And among the woes in verse 42, 43, 44, and verse 46, and verse 47. So we are going to get primarily from the religionists in the future, brethren. From the religionists. So whoever is going to be upon us in the future, we are to remember the words of Jesus Christ. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. The very ones they are sent to are the ones that devour them. Verse 31. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel? Or a land of darkness. Why do my people say, we are lords? We will come no more to you. You see, in the past, they were the royal generation and priesthood. Now, they are a perverted generation and captives. Now, can you blame it on God that they went into wilderness and were in the land of darkness? We notice the attitude of the people. They did not need God. They felt like they can make it on their own. Verse 32. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Now you see uh, a virgin uh, attires, ornaments 
Wedding, brother, wedding day is a day you never forget. <laughs> now, strangely enough, the house of Israel forgot it. The house of Israel had beauty, love, protection from God, but they did not remember. So don't think God's people continually went God's way. No, Jeremiah was not limited in prophesying to Babylonian captivity. Verse 33, why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore, you have also taught the wicked women your ways. Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all these things. Blood of souls, you see. <laughs> now, how, how about that, an immortal soul? I didn't know that soul can bleed. Can you imagine that? You know, it's open, it's done brazenly, it is done outwardly, it is done in the name of religion even. It's not as if God had to search in secret for all of the blood, all of the wrongs and the heirs. No, it is on everywhere, it is prominent, you know, it stands out. Verse 35, yet you say, because I'm innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me, because I'll plead my case against you, because you say I have not sinned. Why do you gad about so much to change your way? Also, you shall be ashamed of Egypt as you were ashamed of Assyria. Because, you know, every, everyone they talk to changed their way. They changed their religion. And you will be ashamed of those you trust, of Egypt and Assyria. Verse 37, indeed, you will go forth from him with your hand, hands on your head. For the Lord has rejected your trusted allies and you will not prosper by them. So you see, people in agony would put their hands on the back of their heads and they will not prosper by those allies. Israel today, including the house of Judah, have been seeking allies and to be allied with the world powers. Oh, brethren, of course, in the end, no, it's not going to work. In the end, those allies is actually going to be the ones who will destroy them. 